This installment of Tarot Card Meetings with Benabel will be on the Knights, comparing and studying what seminal texts in history have given as the card meaning attributions for the Tarot de Marseille, the Rider Waite Smith, and the Thoth. We'll also be looking at the deck I created, the Spirit Keeper's Tarot. Going forward, we'll be showcasing the full color Revelation edition of the SKT. We kicked off the course in the Supernal Triangle, or the fiery archetypal world where we've already covered the kings and queens. We crossed to the abyss, passing through the unseen Sephira, Dath, descending below to Chesad, the Tarot Fours, building order from chaos, then the Fives in Givira, destabilizing to expand and progress, then the Sixes in Tifrith, arriving at harmony. And before crossing the veil, we explored the second ethical triangle, the creative world of the mind, corresponding with the element air. Here is successful initiation where the ethical triad designates a union between the human soul and the divine soul, the ethical reconciliation of God's will and the human will. We crossed that veil into Nitzach, realm of sevens, the realm in which we hone our reasoning skills, our discernment, and learn how we can choose to exercise our free will and right of choice. Then we explored the eights in Yod. After our descent below the veil to master discernment and reasoning in Netzach with the realm of sevens, we explored the realm of eights through Yud. We now return in an ascent up and behind the veil into the mysteries, now fortified with discernment and reasoning skills to re-explore Tifereth with the knights, the shining ones in the Empyrean court that are angels or aspects of our higher selves fortified by the discernment and reasoning we acquired during our descent below the veil. Tifereth is a feminine noun signifying harmony and beauty. This emanation is unconditional maternal love and mercy where the upper Sephiroth and the lower Sephiroth and brought into balance. Tifereth is personified by Jacob who wrestled with an angel and became Israel. This is also the realm of the Tarot Knights. In the SKT, the Knights are the Shining Ones, the namesake after the corresponding angel hierarchy. The action-oriented energy of the Knights here convey the dynamic symmetry exemplifying Tifereth, creating a center of gravity between the two polarities of pillars. Boaz is the feminine or dark pillar. Yakim is the masculine pillar, lighter and and together signify a familiar icon from Key 2, the High Priestess card. Mark Horn, author of Tarot and the Gates of Light, likens Tifereth to the realm of Bodhisattvas in the Buddhist tradition. Here in Tifereth, we remember, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so it was revealed in the Book of Illumination, the Sefer Hapahir, in the priestess card, we see the priestess, Sophia, standing in the place of the middle pillar. Tifereth, residence of the knights, here along the middle pillar is where God's will, let there be light, reconciles with the miracles performed, and there was light. Let's also consider how Crowley reconciled the I Ching and the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. We are sourcing this from the Equinox, volume three, numbers seven and eight. On screen, you'll be seeing the I Ching correspondence symbols or glyphs found on the SKT Revelation, now positioned along the Kabbalistic tree per Crowley's attributions. Tifereth, the realm of the knights, would thus correspond with the trigram fire per Crowley. Though in terms of hexagram correspondences, Crowley assigns hexagram 42 to the Prince of Wands, 61 to the Prince of Cups, 57 to the Prince of Swords, and hexagram 53 to the Prince of Discs. None of these four hexagrams assigned to the realm of princes actually contain the trigram fire in Tifereth. So it's it's an intriguing theory, but I admit leaves me with more questions than answers. The Spirit Keeper's Tarot is designed under a different system of I Ching correspondences. 
each card is assigned a trigram rather than a hexagram and two by two in combination the cards build the hexagrams the trigram correspondences are reconciled at the elemental level so two trigrams of the eight correspond with one of the four western alchemical elements fire for the knight of scepters water for the knight of chalices heaven or sky for the knight of swords and earth for the knight of orbs knights the shining ones are always metaphysical elements in action the knight of wands air of fire where the realm of knights corresponds with the element air and the wands correspond with the element fire is about launching takeoff from the point of departure the knight of cups air of water is a spirit guide in soul retrieval and dream visualization this is the stirring of the waters of creation the knight of swords air of air is acting on that creativity exerting courageous even combative willpower this is what weight describes as the intellect unchained the knight of pentacles in the thoth the discs air of earth where per elemental dignities air and earth weaken the rapid volatile pace of air is tamed given some weight and an anchor this is horsepower what moves the engine so things can get done this is productivity in motion before we jump into card meanings let's talk about the toth we're sourcing our information from a 1912 publication in the equinox an occult periodical founded by alistair crowley and the title of that publication was a description of the cards of the tarot when you look at the knights or cavaliers in the Marseille, those young strapping fellas on horseback, and you look at the knights from the Rider Wade Smith deck, the logical conclusion might be that the Toth knights on horseback are their equivalent. But then we read from Crowley himself that the tarot kings are the figures mounted on steeds, riding swiftly and clothed in armor, a force swift and violent in its action, but whose effect soon passes away. Case in point, the cards titled the knights. So then the knight equivalents in the Thoth would be the princes, the mighty son of the king, that was the knight, and the queen. The princes are seated in chariots. And so in this video on the knights, we are going to cover the Thoth princes. Crowley's origins story for his princes is kind of interesting. You'll find this origins story for why the court titles are what they are in the equinox. This story applies to the courts in all four elemental realms, but let's demonstrate the origins story by focusing on the suit of cups. In the old tarot, or the old architectural blueprint of the old eon, the old universe, the King of Cups and Queen of Cups from that old universe had a daughter. That daughter is this Queen of Cups. This Queen of Cups and the Knight of Cups from the new eon, this revised architectural blueprint of the universe, presumably more true, more evolved, had a child. That child is the Prince of Cups, this tarot knight card. Later, we'll cover his sister, the Princess of Cups, daughter of the Knight and Queen, Though brother and sister, they also marry, but as the prophecy of the Aeon of Osiris holds, as told in the Book of Thoth, the prince shall die, leaving the princess widowed. See what he did there, and why the knight is the king and the prince is the knight? Let's start with the Cavalier de Baton, or the Knight of Wands. On screen, there in black and white for your coloring pleasure, is the Boda Tarot. Under the Marseille system, according to McGregor Mathers, this is fiery action that results in the departure from what had been a stationary point or a separation from this union. So by way of a few examples, if the Two of Cups is drawn immediately after the Knight of Wands, 
then together these cards foretell a separation from a lover, a departure happening in a romance or friendship, disunion among kindred spirits. If the Knight of Wands is paired with the Four of Swords, we now have a double negative, which equals a positive. So here we see the end of solitude, the end of a retreat or a reunion of some sort. There is someone who was in social isolation emerging again, being a part of the community once more. The Knight of Wands paired with the Three of Coins brings a negative meaning to the otherwise positive Three of Coins. By itself, the Three of Coins is an elevation in rank, dignity, or power. Paired with the Knight of Wands, however, which shows the verb or action of departure, we see a demotion, descent, lowering of rank or power. In the 1881 Baleen Tarot, which features handwritten keywords, you'll see that the assigned meaning echoes this concept of the Knight of Wands. The Kambata Ndu Sapter indicates a departure. There is a legend of a Huarang knight pictured here in the shining flame who was young, brave, and took off from base camp in the middle of the night to attack the enemy. He was caught several times, and each time, due to how young and brave he was, he inspired the mercy of the enemy's general, so each time he was returned to his master unharmed. The shining flame is the courage and maybe even a little bit of the recklessness to dare to depart from and venture away from your comfort zone. According to Waite, his Knight of Wands is heading out on a journey, but he's not wearing warlike armor and he's passing pyramids. This is a fun adventure, one where the spirits are positive. In the Thoth, the Prince of Wands characterizes a fast-talking, strong, courageous, impulsive, hot-headed, and opinionated young man. This can designate someone whose sun sign or rising sign is a degree in the last deacon of Cancer, moon in Cancer, or the first two deacons of Leo, Saturn in Leo, or Jupiter in Leo. By the way, the transcripts for every video lecture in this series is provided in tandem, and if you're serious about using this series to study the tarot, then I would recommend having the lecture transcripts on hand while you listen, because seeing the words reinforces the learning process. Reading the text while experiencing my lecture, having the visuals, actively taking notes, handling your cards, all of it together will help reinforce and solidify the learning process. In the SKT, the four knights have as their companions the four mythical elemental creatures. Here in the Shining Flame, it's the salamander, which you'll see embroidered on the golden tunic of the Knight of Wands in the RWS. By the way, not related, or maybe it is, the composition of Key 11 Lust, the strength card from the Thoth, is rather similar to the composition of the Knight of Wands here in the RWS, isn't it? Pictured here on Lust is Babylon, riding the beast per Revelation 17. And here's the Prince of Wands, the knight equivalent in the Thoth. Notice how the sigil of To Megatherion, Greek for the great beast or the mark of the beast, is on the breast of the Prince of Wands. To Megatherion, if you recall, was also inscribed into the blade of the Ace of Swords. You'll also find it embedded into the Ace of Discs in that center medallion, the same sigil found on that Prince of Wands now with the added 666, just in case it wasn't clear what this is all about. To Megatherion also appears along the outer ring of that Ace of Discs medallion. This relates back to Babylon, the Scarlet Woman consort to the great beast To Megatherion. The devil, writes Crowley, isn't just the poison described by Freud and the shadow that Carl Jung talks about, you know, the devil card, shadow work, blah, 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 but the devil is also the lust for knowledge, the thirst for power, which, if tamed by the holy guardian angel, transforms into divine wisdom. And if you're thinking, this is the satanic devil-worshipping talk of Crowley, 
Well, that devout Catholic, Aliphus Levy, says pretty much the same thing in Transcendental Magic. When art goes through the experience of the devil, there will be a dismantling and a purging that reveals the star within. Incidentally, the card entry for Lust in the Book of Thoth features a recurring imagery and reference to these stars. Crowley further makes reference to the sign of Capricornus, Capricornus the white goat, as the lord of the stars. The, quote, cruelty, misery, and collective insanity, end quote, descriptive of the devil as demonstrated by the error of Christian mystics is tethered inextricably to knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. Let's take a look at the tree of life again. Tifrith is the sphere of the tarot knights. The path from Givra to Tifrith is the path corresponding with key 11, which in the Thoth is lust, equivalent to the strength card. The path from Hod to Tifrith is the path corresponding with key 15, the devil, the consort to Babylon, the scarlet woman pictured on key 11. The path from Yasad leading to the sphere of the knights is the path of key 14, the angel, alchemized from the union of the great beast and the scarlet woman through the knights. These knights, the Thoth princes, carry divine will through the path of art, which is knowledge and conversation with the holy guardian angel into the realm of nines through key 21, the world, and finally into Malkuth, the realm of the pages or princesses. Yowzers, we are way off topic. Let's put a pin in this and we'll circle back to deep dive into these cards when we get to the major arcana. But I think this is good. Micro doses of Hermetic Kabbalah. And by the way, by the time we're through, all of this will be solidly encoded in your mind's memory and comprehension. Upright, in general, the Knight of Wands, Prince of Wands, is telling you to act on your impulse to advance. Court cards are typically interpreted as people, and for this card, I've read everything from blonde-haired, blue-eyed young man to dark-haired and friendly. So let's just stick with personality traits. Reversed, this is hesitation to do what you are yearning to set out to do. This is rejecting your own courage, your own true will. I think of this energy as initially running out toward an adventure, but just a few gallops out, you stop, think twice, nope, never mind, and turn back to base camp, back to safety and familiarity. If the Knight of Wands was about departure, then the Knight of Cups is about arrival and approaching toward. The Knight of Cups, followed by the Three of Coins, for example, amplifies the positive forecast of this card, so it's quick advancement toward some kind of a promotion with financial gains. The Knight of Cups, paired with the Four of Swords, could suggest emotion-charged action that results in a retreat, an abandonment of something that results in solitude. And with the Two of Cups, here's a really good omen for love and a romantic relationship. The Baleen 1881 tarot keywords also suggests that this card signifies an arrival of something. The facial expressions of the people in some of these historical decks, <laughs> am I right? Here's the Soprafino, and here's the Knight of Cups in the Visconti. The RWS Knight of Cups has some interesting juxtapositions. He's decked out in full protective armor, but Waite describes him as graceful, not warlike, riding quietly. The winged helmet, which you'll also find on the Thoth Prince of Cups, refers to the higher graces of imagination. This is someone who is a dreamer. When this card comes up, you might be offered a proposition. Reversed, Wait warns that the Knight of Cups is a duplicitous, two-faced person saying one thing but meaning or intending to do another. I might liken this energy to creativity, romance, or progressivism, liberalism gone awry. Study the detailed imagery in these cards while I talk. 
Crowley cautions us that the whole of the symbolism in the Prince of Cups is exceedingly complicated. For better and for worse, this personality is an artist in all his ways. If you think about the I Ching hexagram, hexagram 61, that Crowley assigns to the Thoth Prince of Cups, this card depicts a wind blowing across a lake, nourishing, bringing joy, but be careful, warns the Book of Changes, that you are responsive, not reactionary. To get to the truth, you must show empathy and sympathy, and that is the root wisdom here in the Knight of Cups. The backdrop of the shining waters, by the way, waves of the Undine, which is the magical creature associated with water, is Florence during the height of the Italian Renaissance. In esoteric tarot, the knight or prince of cups is the airy part of water or steam, which is how Crowley describes the alchemy of this card. And steam is produced when fire heats water. There's Scorpio energy here, which is a water sign traditionally represented by an eagle ruled by Mars, a fiery planet that also rules over Aries. There is a secret violence to this personality, someone who is going to present as calm, romantic, and charismatic, but that is but a mask for an intense, passionate zealot who may hold extremist views. Secretly, this personality is ruthless even when their intentions are benevolent, and it's that dark side unseen that is revealed when this card appears in reverse. Let's talk about the astrological correspondences for the Knights. The most common zodiac attributions when working with the RWS is to follow the elementals. So the Wands Court corresponds with the fire signs, the Cups Court corresponds with the water signs, and so on. Crowley's zodiac attributions for the courts follow the decanates or deacon rulers. So the Prince of Wands corresponds with the third decanate of Cancer and the first two decanates of Leo. The Prince of Cups corresponds with the third decanate of Libra and the first two decanates of Scorpio and so on. You can download a JPEG image file of that zodiac and tarot courts wheel from my website. I'll link it in the video description box. Instead of the clear categories of elementals, Crowley says that each court card is a little of one elemental sign and a little of the other because, quoting, the reason for this is that in the realm of the elements, all things are mixed and confused, counterchecked and counterbalanced. Okay, moving on to the Knight or Prince of Swords. In the Marseille, this is the quintessential soldier. Everything about this card says warrior spirit. This person is highly skilled, highly trained, always shows up on time, is prompt and professional. In traditional fortune telling, this could represent a spy, a secret operative, someone who might be treating you like a pawn because it's not about you, it's about a mission. I also like the implications of a personality who is arrogant, but perhaps that arrogance comes from just being inexperienced. The Knight of Swords is not a bad guy. He just doesn't totally know what he's doing, but thinks he does, which admittedly is a pretty bad combination. Also, before I continue, notice the side profile face on the knight's shoulder in all these historical iterations of the card. You'll find this motif in Key 7, the chariot card, this knight of swords, and the king of swords. This is a pauldron, part of the plate armor circa 15th century. Ornately embellished armor was popular in Italy at the time. Only someone of wealth and status would have such a pauldron. So our dear Knight of Swords here is no ordinary soldier. Reversed, the negative qualities of the Knight of Swords are more pronounced. 
per Crowley. This is someone who cares too much for trends and fashions, the superficial. Perhaps someone who drinks too much, who self-medicates, or who is prone to becoming fanatical about music, religion, or social justice. Actually, Crowley's word for it is humanitarianism. They wander from one cult or one vice to another. One of my favorite descriptions of the Knight of Swords comes from Crowley, who describes this personality as someone glib to quote scripture aptly and cunningly to support any thesis whatsoever. He is impossible to defeat because he is impossible to pin down. You don't know what his position is and you don't know where he's going. And for that reason, in the Shining Gale, the setting is obscured by clouds. You'll see the opening passage to the Diamond Sutra here, a sacred text about cutting through illusions and sudden flashes of high-level insight. To know what it is, you must know what it is not. What it is not is also what it is. Wade describes the Knight of Swords as powerful, with the capability of scattering his enemies. He's heroic and pure of heart, and yet there is a sense of wrath and going on the warpath in this card's divinatory meaning. The Knight of Swords is the energy of opposition and resistance. Crowley describes the Prince of Swords as one with a reputation for being highly intellectual. Notice the diamond that is the prince's chariot, Diamond Sutra. The sylph is a fairy-like air spirit, which you'll find depicted in the Thoth Prince of Swords. I've given the sylph a culture-specific makeover in the Shining Gale. In the RWS, you're going to see representations of butterflies throughout the knight, queen, and king of this suit. Notice how in the Thoth, the charioteer himself is a sylph commanding smaller sylphs to pull his chariot. This could be symbolic of manipulation or a domineering influence over others. Finally, almost done, the knight from the elemental realm of Earth. Coins, pentacles, discs, and orbs, because apparently nobody can agree on what this suit should be called. Here is someone useful, trustworthy, prudent, and cautious. On screen, you'll also see versions of the Knight of Coins from the Alouette deck published by Grimaud around 1858 and Dumb Fortune's Wheel Tarot by Paul Hewson. The Knight of Coins represents someone who is very competent at what he does, reliable and gainfully employed. He has his eyes on his money, managing it responsibly at all times. Reversed, the slowness or lacking in swiftness associated with the Knight of Pentacles hurts more than it helps. Ill-dignified, the Knight of Coins shows someone brave with swagger, but probably unemployed, lazy, or isn't going to have the resources to be of service. It can indicate slowness in pacing, resulting in delays. This is a lack of effort. Financially, this can be an indication that you need to think of ways to increase cash flow, profit, or income, or depending on neighboring cards, this can be referring to your physical health. Your body is lacking nutrients, and so its life force weakened. In the SKT, when the Shining Quarry comes up, the message is this. Sometimes the best action is non-action. Magically, the Shining Quarry as a tarot talisman is a finder's card. It will help you find or recover that which is lost. In general, the essential wisdom of the Knight of Pentacles is this. Don't feel like everything needs to be accomplished tomorrow. Take your time. The horse you ride is heavier set for a reason. In the Thoth, Prince of Discs, the charioteer looks meditative. The mathematical symbols in the orb represent planning in agriculture. Notice the cube of space. In the other hand, the orb mounted on a cross symbolizes the great work accomplished. Crowley says something about this card that I really love. The Prince of Discs seeks out new uses for common things. By the way, pause the screen and study the detailing in that Prince of Discs. It's pretty incredible. 
And that concludes our lecture on the Tarot Knights, the Thoth Princes. We've been studying the minor arcana of the tarot patterned after the Sephiroth on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, navigating them by way of the paths, though we haven't yet talked about those paths. We will when we get to the major arcana. I keep showing you an animated map of where we've been and where we're going along the Tree of Life because I hope the more you see this, the more your knowledge and understanding of Tarot and Kabbalah's intersection is reinforced. Through repetition, through seeing this, hearing about it over and over, you are encoding comprehension of Tarot and Hermetic Kabbalah into your memory. Now on to the nine. 